Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. So, Bruce, big news. The Oilers have a new GM confirmed. All but, all but signed, sealed, and delivered, but uh, it's clearly happening based on what we heard from... Uh... Yeah, based on what we heard from uh, Ryan Detroit. and other people. Uh, what well, we heard from Detroit Canada that he sub- submitted his resignation. Sorry about yeah. that phone rang. Uh, I've got um, uh, just so there's no other outcome. But I was kind of expecting a neat and tidy bow that there'd be a nice press conference this morning at 10 o'clock with uh, Bob Nicholson and, uh, and uh, Ken Holland sitting around a table. And instead, the news came out during Game of Thrones last night, uh, basically it was a done deal. And I guess we'll probably get the presser tomorrow. Yes. Well, so. I hope his, uh, I hope Holland's uh, time with the Oilers ends better than the Game of Thrones series. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. It's been really super weak. Anyway, oh, yeah? let's not get into that. Let's get into Bruce. Uh, let's, let's start with Twitter. We're going to talk about Holland's record in some detail today and yeah. get into uh, the – early moves he has to make with the orders, including personnel and hiring a coach. Uh, we're also going to be talking uh, so about his uh, signings, draft record, all that kind of thing. Bruce, let's, um, let's start with the reaction on Twitter. Because oh. when this story broke on Sunday, there was an immediate reaction in Edmonton. And it kind of, it, it, of course, it's all kinds of fans, so the reaction was diverse. But it ranged from, I would say, mild mildly positive to profoundly almost bitterly negative um lots of negativity bruce Mm -hmm. um and and i i would i would characterize it from the same people who were always critics of shirelli um generally we're always critics of all the other guys and and yeah i guess they think they can all think they can do it better well, and I, I mean, unfortunately, the history shows that the Oilers have had weak management for quite a long period of time now. So all of their many critics have lots of grist for their mills. That's for sure. But to pre-criticize the next guy uh, and just assume the worst, is that's the part that kind of gets my goat. Well, I, I do think it sets you up for confirmation bias and mm. being a, kind of a bitter fan uh, who I will mute on Twitter. But that's if if people want to be that that fan, that's that's fine for them. They can they can do that. I I do think um, you know there there was there's no shortage of things though when it comes to Holland to be critical of. And you mm-hmm. know it, it is true sure. that the Detroit Red Wings have uh, gone downhill and have become a capped out bottom end team the last few years. So. That's the that's the kind of the um, the, the uh, headline. If you want it, and I wrote probably I wrote a headline like that on a call on a post I wrote on Friday essentially that um, since since his last really good draft pick, I, I I would say his last exceptional draft steal in 2004, Johan Franson, they they have really suffered in Detroit by um, poor drafting and um, then some questionable decisions for a while. That said, Bruce. A little closer look at his um, at his record uh, shows that I think he's kind of changed course dramatically in the last in, since two thousand since July two thousand and seven and that kind of trading season. So two two three years then of hockey uh, or two years of hockey and um, two two summer seasons he's completely changed direction and we're going to get into that. Let's let's start though with some of the comments on Twitter. So we'll start with. Here's John Bucci Gross. He's a U.S. sports writer, is he not? Yes. Fairly famous one. I think he works for ESPN or did. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, here's what he wrote. Very famous one. Ken Holland jumping into the cold and perilous management waters of the Edmonton Oilers inspires me. The cushy, easy thing would be to stay in Detroit and coast. Doesn't fit him. Holland is a grinder, focused and impervious to ease. I hope he kills it and helps bring McDavid a cup. Then he, he continued on. I think money has little to do with Ken Holland's decision. He's got money. This is about a life. This is about a life of ease or jumping back into the fire again in a situation that outside of uh, 1997 is not ideal. Western Canada and five million were nice ornaments. He's ultra competitive. What do you think of that take, Bruce? Well, ultra competitive sounds good to me. Uh, I'm happy with his. Um, uh, 
what you described of his um, end of season presser, like he says the right things. Sounds like he says them in English and with a smile on his face, at least occasionally. Um, so there, there are things, you know, the one thing about uh, Ken Holland coming here is that this is the one guy that certainly does have a track record for us to examine and to uh, both criticize and praise. Yeah, there's no shortage of grist for the mill right now, actually. Uh, there's lots of digging to do. And if you want to do an assessment, of course, he's been hired, so it's kind of late. Like it's, But, but it does give us a sense of where he's been and if he if he does adjust because i think the big question about him bruce is can he adjust can he change his ways because things weren't going well in detroit and can he get out of that rut so here's a comment from uh west cory cory west i think he's in arizona at west cory and definitely in the camp that criticized shirelli um how many times will we hear the detroit model in the next coming weeks when really the Detroit model was just really was really just crushing three drafts, so so Corey's making a point that that um, Detroit's success really fundamentally is all based on three amateur drafts. Uh, I, I think it's more like four or five actually, which is sounds like the Edmonton model. Yeah, that was the Edmonton model in the yeah. 1980s, and and it is a hell of a model, Bruce. There's no better <laughs> model than crushing it in the draft, so you can't really three years in a row. In and he case. was the head of amateur drafting at the time, so um, yeah. now as we know from the Oilers in the 1980s, the, the uh, someone who leads amateur drafting can uh, fall off the face of the earth when it comes to his draft picks because Barry Fraser went from the best ever to maybe the worst ever in his uh, career with the Oilers. All right, let's uh, keep going. Um, here is Ben, at Ben and Yeg. Oilers Twitter is like days of our lives. <laughs> this was great. You can leave for 10 years, come back, and Marlena is still possessed. Stefano is trying to kill John Black. Bo and Hope are trying to get their love back. And the Oilers need a competent management group while fans eat each other alive in speculation. <laughs> he isn't far wrong. Oh, I don't know days of our lives. So. No, neither do I. But I, I think the young and the restless, so restless is the soap opera of choice in our household, of which I watch about five minutes a year. And the, but I recognize the same storylines to sort of keep keep in place for forty years. In that case, I think it is. <laughs> oh, we sure have had the same storylines for the last ever since actually Kevin Lowe left as GM. I think you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think he was the last really truly competent uh manager running the team and mm -hmm. um it's been a bit of a mess since and then. kevin lowe in 2007 and 08 was trying to do what ken holland tried to do after detroit's town yeah. vein petered out he kept he kept trying to do these emergency fixes, fixes by chasing giant whales like uh thomas vanek and and uh, uh Nylander and danny heatley and Hosa, uh, heatley and, yeah, so, uh, but up and certainly up until throughout the little team that could era with no, uh, with uh, limited budget, he was uh, very good. And he almost completely hit it out of the park in 06, the year, first year of the salary cap when he, when he took advantage of some team salary cap issues. Yeah. But let's move on to Beer yeah. League Hero Bruce. Mm -hmm. At Beer League Hero says, I hope Ken Holland wears all of his Stanley Cup rings. The media availability introducing him as the new gm of the oilers <laughs> so he's trolling fans i think because because there's this you know the, the fans that don't like him uh will say he's just riding on his past for stanley cup wins and um mm -hmm. yesterday's man but the, here's the thing though uh, he knows the thing about winning from a general manager's chair it's yes. not like he won as a player 20 or 30 years ago and is trying to to uh superimpose those lessons onto an entirely different job he's done this job and succeeded at it and, and that has value i don't know how it does here's another oilers fan jason at alberta oil fire he says i will support holland until he gives me a legitimate reason not to i definitely don't understand cherry picking things in his past to complain about name me a gm with longevity that never made a bad deal or signing 100 percent I'm more like 50 50 on that, Bruce, because okay. I, I want to see trends because I do think people can go up and down in their careers. 
-hmm. and they can be strong for a long time and then they're kind of coasting so um is he still hungry is he still making the right decisions is he still learning adapting um so you know going into when i was first hearing his name i had a pretty negative reaction because his his troubles and detroit's troubles are well known they're a capped out team that's crappy they haven't had a lot of success in the draft right. for a long time um some bad signings of bad contracts so i think it's perfectly reasonable to bring up that stuff and to question oh. the decision but at the same time um to think about his attributes and to, to try to have a serious look and, and has he changed? What did he get right in the past? What does he bring to the table that, that might, might, that might help the situation now? Right. No, I'll wear him a hundred percent is this. I will support Holland until he gives me a legitimate reason not to. Gotcha. Uh, the, uh, uh, and his other comment was talking about cherry picking. If as you uh, suggest, you look at the whole record, the good and the bad. Yeah, absolutely. Of course he analyzed the whole record, but just saying, well, he stinks because the last five years Detroit has gone downhill is maybe not giving full credit for how damn high that hill was for how long before that. And it's, um, uh, as for him not being hungry, well, it was an easy decision for him to just stay in Detroit and ride the wave right into the Hall of Fame where you know he's going. And he's taken on this challenge. So presumably, uh, if he's not hungry and he's doing that, then, uh, you know, doesn't even add up well he doesn't look like sleepy ken to me like from his press conference he was spitting pissing vinegar bruce like he he was chomping at the bit mm -hmm. absolutely passionate chomping at the bit to rebuild the right and, and and i it, liked a lot of go ahead i uh, sorry i liked a lot of his um sort of underlying rationale of, of what he valued yeah he had um, said a lot of really good things didn't he bruce in yeah that press like, conference like, about like his defenseman that can skate and move the puck for example and he's seen so many drafts. He's seen so many, and like he knows how hard it is to develop these guys into the NHL players, even after they've been drafted. And he just knows how fraught that is, and and presumably he knows how to, to make it right or make it wrong in, ter in terms of doing that. Now, of course, they have He hasn't done it in a long time, with with especially on defense in Detroit. They haven't developed many good defensemen in that organization for the last 10, 15 years. So, I mean, since yeah, since Johan Eriksson and. Um, Kyle Quincy and Nicholas Cronwell. So okay, here's Jeff Follett at Jeff Follett. I think he's a Toronto sports release yes. fan. He's a blogger. And he says, yeah. um, and I don't mean that as a, a pejorative to call him a Leafs fan. Leaf, I think Leafs he and Marlies. He's, a, he's an expert on the Marlies. Yeah, I think he is a fan. And, and that's and he's a fan. Cool. He's, he's a, a fan. fan blogger like yeah. us. And he says, the Oilers will never, ever figure themselves out. All this talk about deep examination, self-reflection, self-reflection, and interviewing people with plans, all to ultimately throw cash at a guy who didn't interview, whose philosophies are the exact same as the status quo with ties to the boss. That's a pretty good summation of the like the not like the negative take <laughs> on the on the hiring of Holland. Now we don't know if he like this suggestion, he Jeff Follett, all due respect, does not know if Ken Colin did or didn't interview with uh Nicholson. No one knows. That's not been reported, has it, Bruce? It, no, it hasn't been reported. Uh, and it's hard to imagine there wasn't some kind of exchange. I, I, as for having the exact same hockey philosophy, I'm not sure that I buy that. It's like, it's not let's right. put them That's all, not let's, correct. let's stereotype them, put them all in the box. Uh, I mean, they may be from the same generation or, you know, what have you, but it's it doesn't necessarily mean they think the exact same. Uh, and and Bruce, come on! Like this is this is an incorrect statement. Is yeah. the truth? Because all of these years, what we've known about Detroit was, and what they were hailed as, is taking risks on smaller skilled players in the draft, mm -hmm. and hoping those guys will fill out. That Nicholas Lidstrom will put on 20, 30 pounds, and Datsuk and Zetterberg the same. Mm -hmm. And these guys, they, they just again and again and again take risks on these little skinny guys, and see if they'll pan out. And and remarkably, or not remarkably. Uh, maybe predictably, they did, yeah. and, and and so this is a guy who clearly was never in the ho heavy hockey, heavy hockey camp. He went for what the the analytics, uh, so-called analytics crowd, went heavily for in favor of a skill um, approach to hockey. That's what they wanted to see. Well, Holland was at the forerunner of that way before they were. With them, you know, he didn't have analytics, and 
And I don't know how much of the predilection for skill with the analytics people is just kind of a, you know, maybe there's people who like skill also like analytics. I don't know if they're related actually, but um, anyway, he's, he's always like skill. So I don't think Jeff's, Jeff's right about well, that. Well, <clears throat> heavy hockey. I remember one time writing a, a post and, and researching the um, number of fighting majors around yeah. the NHL. And Detroit was dead last in the league for like eight years in a row or something. It was like, it just stood right out. Like other teams would have 30, 40, 60 fights and Detroit would have 12, you know, <laughs> and that just, I mean, not that fights equal heavy hockey, but there's obviously some overlap between the, between the two and, and what is valued as, you know, contributing to the team's success. And clearly Detroit didn't see uh, uh drop in the mitts and, throwing punches is something that was of value to them. And they were very successful without that uh, uh, capacity. All right. Here's a uh, Oilers junkie at Oilers junkie. And he, and his tweet is Oilers now. And he's referring to Bob Stoffer show Oilers now this coming Monday. And the Oilers Twitterverse will complain about the Holland hire, but I'll tell you what, the guy knows how to build a winner. <laughs> and then he's going ahead to Oilers now 2020. <laughs> <laughs> No one could have seen this coming, <laughs> which is you know, Bob's in a tough position, right? He works for the team. Oh, he can't good. really, he can't be, a, he's got to put a, an Oilers friendly, positive spin on it. So even if he doesn't like moves made by Shirelli, he, he, he he's not at liberty to say it. it is completely right. said he can hint at it or be muted in credit, muted in praise, but he can't really come out and blast. But so anyway, that that's a funny, it was, it was funny. Yeah. All right, uh, go ahead. I give points for uh, for humor, even if I don't agree with the underlying, underlying pretext. So certainly it's a possible future that we've seen come to pass in the past. Yes. Okay, here's from Gord Miller at Gord Miller TSN. When the Oilers circled back with an offer this week, Ken Holland called friends in the game to get their thoughts. One of them warned him about the poisonous atmosphere around the team. You'll get killed on social media, he warned. I'm not on social media, Holland replied. So what do you make of that? Hmm. Well, uh, yeah. Probably a good self-defense maneuver for any of these guys to not be on social media because it can get toxic at times. Uh, I was a little surprised, uh, a little mildly disappointed in Gord Miller with his Edmonton background to be making a... a a comment like that but there it's not you know it's not without some cause obviously there's uh, uh there I are think, days I, there are days that's just i think it. uh bruce the oilers twitter has been plagued with a higher percentage of hockey fans who believe they should be gm than any other fan base in the nhl i think that's our fundamental issue is we have like maybe in, in some fan bases there's like one there's between one and 25 percent of fans who think they should be at bgm or are smarter than the gym and in, in, in edmonton it's 50 well, percent or all well if you do if you're going to go with the i uh, think they can do a better job than the gm then you're starting with a lower bar in edmonton than there are in other places based <laughs> well, on the their other, actual performance so that's the other reason for the poisonousness now of yeah. course court is reporting here like when i read the quote again you know, when I read it at the time, I was a little bit hot about it. But now reading it, he's just reporting something that happened, yeah. right? And and I do love Holland's response. Mm -hmm. and, and I do, I players are, I believe, I think players are insane if they're on social media. They are insane to be on social media. It is way too negative. They should not be there. And um, and GMs and coaches, they shouldn't be there either. I mean, they're not, they just stay away. Just stay away. It's There's... Well, it's a good way that there's a lot going for it but you know some days it's anti-social media you know it's so fans are so up and down and toxic and happy and crazy and 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 all over the place i don't think there's a lot to be gained from it uh let's go with dean millard at duck millard does anyone else think hiring ken holland is a little like shirelli like shirelli holland has won it all more than once but he also has put the wings in a bad uh, spot cap-wise like Shirelli did in Boston and Edmonton. I think Holland is a smart man, but I see similarities. What say you? Uh, hi, Dean. Uh, I also say um, uh, Holland, like Detroit was number one in the NHL and cap hit this last year. Yeah. Uh, like 86 million and no other team was over the 79.5. But that said, they had three 
uh, long-term injury situations, two of them like permanent with uh, uh, Zetterberg and Franzen, I think it was. Yeah. And only Mike Green that kind of went on long-term reserve during the season. Uh, so he was working knowing that he had that cushion all year long. So it's kind of deceptive that way. They are going to be clearing some contract, uh, expiring contracts. I understand 15 million coming off the books this year and 15 million next. A lot of money, yeah. And yeah, which I wish the situation applied in Edmonton. Like he's got some heavy lifting to do here to, to uh, deal with next year's cap. And I'm going to be writing about that. Um, but uh, uh, he. I mean, clearly things have not gone well for the Red Wings. They missed the playoffs, was three years in a row now, and just sort of bottoming out. But partly that's just the cycles of life, right? I mean, in, in the game yeah. of hockey. He he reminds me, this reminds me more, Bruce, of the Glenn Sather signing, uh, the New York Rangers signing um, Glenn Sather in 2000. Uh, Glenn Sather mm -hmm. had been that's, fantastic that's GM, had had some not doing so well um, when the situation changed in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. due, due to money he hadn't been able to adapt which is a pretty big factor at that time i mean it was a huge factor uh but say there you know he was kind of struggling along and doing okay and you know maybe that's what we could say about holland but it, two people with impeccable credentials uh you know absolutely the top credentials in some ways um and all kinds of success in the past uh but a little longer in the tooth and not the young if you're looking for the young tiger to come in here and i think that's that's what i honestly wanted uh, I think deep down was that that find that guy find Glenn Sather in 1978, not Glenn Sather in night in 2000. You know, that's who I was. Yeah. Hoping they'd find. It's pretty hard to find Glenn Sather in 1978. And maybe you got to get a little lucky to be Glenn Sather from 1978. Okay. Uh, let's go now. Uh, here's Wheaton oil at Wheaton oil. People are worried that Holland is Chia 2.0 and there are similarities, especially in contracts and such. I also have major reservations about Holland. I'll say this, though. If Edmonton has Holland instead of Shirelli in 2015, they're not in the spot they're at today. I say that because Holland doesn't trade a first and a sec high second for Reinhardt. He doesn't trade Hall for Larson. Chia had many faults, but those types of trades were the real backbreakers. Nothing in Holland's history suggests he makes those trades, while those trades weren't new for Chia. And I think that is a completely fair and accurate mm -hmm. comment to make. Um, although he did trade draft picks, I believe Hall into in the uh, now and then in the push to make the playoffs. Right. You know? Yeah, he, before 2016, he used to trade picks for players, and then uh, the last couple of years he's done it the other way around. He's traded out players for picks. So it's possible he might have made the the Reinhardt trade, but I don't think he would have gone for a player like Griffin Reinhardt. I don't think that player was in his wheelhouse, but he might he have traded gone for a player like Adam Larson, not for he, he would not have, and or Manning or like you know, Chia was all all about the heavy hockey, and then he talked about getting puck movers, and he drafted mm -hmm. Caleb Jones and Bouchard, and he signed Sekera, but he also when he when he traded Taylor Hall, he didn't get an elite puck mover, and um, certainly Manning and Petrovic were heavy hockey disasters. They've 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 made heavy hockey a really really bad name in Edmonton right now. Okay. Oh, and Lucic. And Lucic, of course. All right. Uh, let's leave. Let's let's go on from there now, Bruce. Let's get into okay. Holland's uh, record. And so here's what I want to say. Let's start with his draft record. And going back to what Corey, Corey, Corey West was saying, owners fan Corey West, about Holland's record being based on three drafts. And um, there's some truth to that, Bruce. Um, so there was this fabulous 1989 draft where they got um, Mike Sillinger in the first round, who played 1,049 NHL games, Nicholas Lidstrom in the third round, who is one of the top 10 NHL players of all time, yep. played no 1,564 games, Sergei Fedorov, one of the great players oh. of his era, 1,248 games, Dallas Drake, who played 1,009 games, <laughs> they got. And they got... Here's they got Vladimir Konstantinov, Bruce, who oh. played only 446 games, but because of a car accident, cut his career short. He would have played a thousand games. He would have been so a fifth they, guy at a thousand games. He was a wonderful. So player. It, so they got four guys who played a thousand games in the NHL in that one draft. Next year, next two years, they take Kozlov and Primo. Great year. 
year after that, they take Martin Lapointe, who played 991 NHL games, and Mike Knubel, 10, 000, or 1,068 NHL games. They took Chris Osgood, who played 744 NHL games. The year after that, they take Darren McCarty, 758 games. Uh, the year after that, Anders Eriksson, 572. Then they take, the year after that, Thomas Holstrom, 1,026. Matthew Dandeneau, 868. Wow. They have three bad drafts in a row after that, but then they get Pavel Datsuk in the sixth round. Then they take the next year, Henrik Zetterberg, in the um, seventh round. Well, and part, which part of that time was Holland himself sort of directly overseeing the amateur draft? Most of it, Bruce. So yeah. until 90, I think he takes over his GM in 90, was it 97, 98? What is it? Yeah. Yeah, but before that, he was working so, in there. So all of those really great drafts, Ken Holland's running that show. Now, here's the thing. From about 2004, until they changed draft chief scouts, I think the last three years, Bruce, mm -hmm. they've done pretty well. They've got a really good, like, it's always hard to tell, right? Yeah. But they have a lot of young players who seem to be tre trending really well, including um, a, a great young attacking defenseman, Philippe Hronik, and mm -hmm. another one, Dennis Chalowski. Um, and we still don't know, of course, how their two big first-round draft picks the last two years, Philip Zadina and Michael Rasmussen, are going are gonna to turn out. And that's absolutely crucial for that franchise. But they had a really dry spell of about 10 years where they where they had limited help in the draft and that's what that's what killed this team and um i they've had so it wasn't actually hawk and anderson the great swedish scout he didn't take lidstrom he wasn't in charge in that draft it was a different swedish scout um anderson comes on when they his first big find is holmstrom but i think uh one of the issues was they they invest they hawk and anderson was chief scout of the detroit Red Wings, and he had about 20 picks in that dry spell bruce mm -hmm. And he didn't hit on many of them. He he hit on a, just a couple of them. Maybe, you know, it wasn't bad, but he didn't find that really great European player again. I mean, he got a couple of good players like Kali Yarncroft, Thomas Tatar, mm -hmm. but he didn't find the next. And so, I mean, how hard it is, is it to find the next Datsuk Gus, or the next Zetterberg? Gus Nyquist. Yeah, well, those guys aren't exactly falling off trees. And uh, he, he did well to get as many truly outstanding ones as he did. I mean, the story on Hack and Anderson is that uh, he was in the Detroit system for a while, and the, finally one year they gave him a draft choice. That, okay, you get to make this pick, but it was in the 10th round, and he took Thomas Holmstrom, who <laughs> went on to win four Stanley Cups. That's a pretty nice uh, way to make a first impression. I think I think that Holland may have been, like Sather was too loyal to, loyal to Barry Fraser, Yes, I think Holland might have been, might be too loyal to Hawk and Anderson. Yes, now Hawk and Anderson did, I think, arguably better with his picks than Barry Fraser did in in the last half of second half of his career. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, I think that's been an issue. Is is they needed to get maybe a different European head scout. Um, I mean, it's not like Anderson's been terrible though, but he he just just hasn't got it done really and and that's been a huge impact and the and none of the scouts in detroit maybe all of the scouts needed changing out in the mid 2000s it's kind of hard to do that though when you've had this record of success with these uh -huh. guys when they've been the best draft team in the nhl by far for a de more than a decade and then yeah. to, to to just to retire them all out probably needed to happen because i think it's a young man's game scouting mm -hmm. it's a hard work game it's like gretzky right now like he's had this success as a draft guy with boston and edmonton i believe with edmonton but it doesn't mean he can ha continue to have success going forward as an amateur scout because i do think you burn out i think it's a, a job where that really does happen so um and i think that's what happened in detroit with uh, hawk and anderson's success and maybe with some of the other scouts in detroit yeah well it's not, sometimes scouts lose their edge over time too you know i mean at, at, at our managing positions like people have a peak and it's not necessarily uh, something that, you know, the older they get, the wiser they get, and they just keep getting better and better. It doesn't always work that way. And, I mean, Barry Fraser, I mean, he freaking moved to Mexico halfway through his career. Pretty hard to scout hockey players from Mexico, I would have to say, especially in pre-internet days. But Okay, 5,000 <laughs> bonus points, Bruce. If you can name the city in Mexico that Barry Fraser... Wasn't it Cabra San Cabo Lucas? Cabo San Lucas, was that it? <laughs> 
Is there, is, if there's ever an indication that you might need to replace your head scout, it's when he spends his winters in Cabo San Lucas. In a now, we don't know how villa. They didn't have the internet then. You couldn't even watch the games exactly. like that. You could watch junior games online. I mean, theoretically, you, you know, you could do a lot of scouting that way. The Buffalo Sabres moved to that model a few years ago. I don't think it worked for them, but um, they moved out of it. Anyway, that's that was the first indication that something was wrong there. So, Bruce, let's talk about his signings mm -hmm. okay uh unless you have something to more to add on this one story. last point yeah and that's in, it has to do with all those trades uh in 2016 he had a first and two seconds 2017 he had a first a second and four third round picks in 2018 two firsts two seconds all in the top 36 so i guess he's going to have a little little uh uh fresher group of prospects because he was trading into the draft pick pool instead of trading out third rounders for Alex Petrovich. Yeah. Look at the last year's draft, Bruce, mm -hmm. two firsts, two seconds and three yeah. thirds. Oh, three so, thirds. Yeah. Yeah. Three there you thirds. go. Like, so, eight, so this is eight this, picks in the top hundred, eight out of the top hundred. This is right out of um, the new England Patriots playbook, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is the idea is, no, it's just a risk drafting these young guys. You don't know. You have an inkling. You, you hope you got it right. But you have 30 teams going over, the 31 teams going over the same pool of players with a fine-tooth comb. And the best way to have success is just give yourself, you know, every every one in five of these guys is maybe going to turn out. So why don't you increase the odds of that by getting more draft picks? And that's exactly what um, uh, Ken Holland seemed to be doing here. So. Good for him. Smart guy in that regard. So, yeah, the trades were they traded away players like Thomas Yerko, 2017, Brandon Smith, 2017. Um, now, those two guys were in their 20s. Riley Sh Thomas Vanek, now that was more of a jump, dumping an older guy at the trade deadline in 2017. Riley Sheehan, 2017. Peter Morazic, 2018. Thomas Tatar, 2018. Nick Jensen, 2019. And Gustav Ny Nyquist. 2019. Now the thing all those players have in common, but Bannock Bruce is they were guys in their late twenties or mid twenties that were being traded out for draft picks, which is really interesting to me. It's not the, what you usually see because player, I think GMs tend to hold on to those guys um, who have been in the league. They just, they're just hoping to win with them, but he traded them out. What do you make of it? Well, it's uh, it's like I say, it's kind of the New England Patriots model. Uh, I mean, the Oilers at times have traded out at the deadline. They traded out uh, for uh, uh, for draft picks. There was uh, one year they traded uh, Justin Schultz and uh, uh, was it Teddy Purcell? Yeah, Got a couple Purcell of third rounders at the deadline, and you know the years Schultz, they were out of the Schultz running. Was a mercy trade, of course, and yeah, and. Purcell was over 30. Have the orders made mm -hmm. that? Like, I mean, they traded, they've <laughs> they've made some terrible Patrick trades. Patrick Maroon, when the guy's contract was expiring and they didn't think they could sign him, they would cash him in, usually. Not yeah, and some of these so chase on. Now, I think Smith and Qatar had term left, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Qatar did, and he got, uh, he got a first, a second, and a third for Qatar. That was an unreal trade. So here's my thinking is that he, that, Holland looked at these players and thought, these aren't the players that are going to put us over the top. They're mm -hmm. not player. We need to get some championship level players. Mm -hmm. And uh, we might even have to go down in the draft to do that. So he is, there's a certain amount of tanking going on here of acceptance that you're going to be less competitive for a few years. So that's part of what's going on. And just the idea of getting more draft picks, uh, higher draft picks. And that's how we're going to win a Stanley cup. He's going for the gusto, I think, in making these moves. He's realizing like his goal is to win a Stanley Cup. He made that clear in that mm -hmm. interview, how mm -hmm. badly he wanted to win a Stanley Cup uh, in Detroit again. And I think that he just made the came to the conclusion that a lot of teams did. So this was what I, I was. How about a soft tank um, that right. that uh, they were going through, and um, and, the, and they did get Zadina sixth overall, and they're going to get the mm -hmm. what is it, the seventh overall, sixth overall pick this year as well. They're, yeah, they're right up there in the. Yeah, in so the, they're going to the get another really. Game. They're going to get another really good hockey player, mm -hmm. um, and 
they're, they're losing all this cap space. Steve, Steve Eiserman isn't moving in, if we're completely honest. He's not moving into a terrible situation in Detroit in terms of, like, they do have to find, they still have to find those one or two outstanding franchise players. But uh, there's cap space, there's draft picks, and maybe the, maybe he's already on their roster, and and uh, maybe it's, you know, Joe Valino or Philip Zadino or Michael Rasmussen, so we'll find out. Right. Well, the th thing is, he's moving into an Edmonton situation where I'm not sure how many assets he has that he can trade off that have value for draft picks. You know, who are they going to trade off of this roster and get a second-round draft pick? Right? Zach Cassian? You know, a lot of these guys are going to, if they do trade them, they're going to have to trade assets with them to get rid of them because the contracts are so onerous. And Edmonton has this weird pressure in that they do have the franchise players, right? It's just building around them. So yeah, it's, it's different. Weird. It's a strange dynamic. And I think it actually pushed a lot of Shirelli's moves, right? Mm -hmm. In that there's, when you have this superstar, the pressure to win now is becomes different. And that's why you end up making, you know, the Lucic signing or maybe the, you know, or, or, or a play like that or the Reinhardt trade where you're trying to get an older player who's going to, uh, develop quicker. They just picked the wrong two players in Lucic and um, and Reinhardt. Now, Holland himself was in that same mold, Bruce, where mm -hmm. he was trying when he had super when he did have those superstar players. He behaved in a similar way as Shirelli. So even and even when they were getting older, like Datsuk and um, uh, Zetterberg getting older into their thirties uh, in 2012, 2013, he was still. He was lavishing, you know, he signed Stephen Weiss, you know, who was 30 mm -hmm. years old and Oops. had been injured most of the year before. Yeah. Signed him to a, a five-year deal at $4.9 million per. That was a real bad one. His last bad one, I think it's a bad one. It's not not as bad as Weiss, but uh, Franz Nielsen, who mm -hmm. was 32 at the time, he signed to a six-year deal at $5.25 million. That was the same day that um, Lucic and Louis Erickson both signed. God, there's for a lot similar of money and there was those it's all these 30 guys going on and the people were throwing six and seven year uh deals at six and five million dollars at them was, whoa he also yeah. threw a lot of money at darren helm and justin abdicator abdicator in um let's see when was that 2015 and helm in 2016. now those were two players in their late 20s i think at the mm -hmm. time who looked at who had been pretty good players but they kind of went the Lucic route and be, have become lesser, much lesser players um, than they were than when they signed. They didn't pan out. So yeah, when when he had a hope of winning, he was certainly going for it. And then he's he backed off to the tank. It's you know, there's a lot of limited op. It seems like there's kind of limited options for whoever, whoever you are as GM in the cap era of the NHL, and you just can't afford to make any screw ups. And uh, Holland did, and but it, he I I. I I don't like what he did between 2013 and 2016. I like what he's been doing since then. So that's my uh, take on that. Are you, I see you, uh, a note to take care of the dog or the cat there for a second. All right, let's move on and talk about Ken Holland's philosophy. So um, he gave a interview at the end of the year. Um, of uh from the, it's kind of his exit interview from the from this season in detroit and he was still thinking about coming back and leading the red wings at that point and um said a few interesting things so uh let me just find a couple of them here um first of all one of his quotes was he was talking about rebuilding the blue line and he said i like defensemen who are mobile and can pass the puck Hallelujah. You back? Hallelujah. That's a wonderful thing to hear. Yes. I like defensemen who are mobile and can pass the puck. Mm -hmm. Bruce, there wasn't one word about grit <laughs> in the entire press conference or about character. Not one word about character. Although it was implied throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, and not, But not one word about culture. Not like the buzzwords that I think at this point rightly drive voters fans crazy. Yeah, you're coming from I've people. had enough of that crap. I yeah. really have. Here's here's what else he said. Here's 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 one of the quotes I really loved. As I look at the 29 at the 2019 20 team, part of them, the defensive group, have to be young. Part of them have to be young so that one day they're old. We got <laughs> to get them on the team when they're 21, 22, 23, but you can't have six of them. 
It's not yeah. fair to them. It's not fair to the fans. It's not fair to the organization. It's not fair to the team because that's a tough position on defense. When you make a mistake, it usually leads to a scoring chance. And if you give up enough scoring chances against good players, you fish the puck out of your net. Bingo. <laughs> so the good news for him, he's coming into a situation very much like Detroit where they've got a lot of good young defensemen pro prospects who are 22-23. And he can integrate a couple of them into the team. This, well, he uh, can as soon as he makes room for him somehow. I mean, that's the issue is how does he uh, – how do you make the space happen? But he does have the – Potential young guys. I got a full six pack of uh, young defensemen who are committed to playing pro hockey in North America next year, who all I would consider are legitimate NHL prospects. And they won't all make it, but they won't none of them make it, right? Some of them will. And the sooner you got one or two of them integrating, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Here's another thing he said he quote, I want this team to win another Stanley Cup. I want the Red Wings to contend for another Stanley Cup, to be a cup contender. I know how hard it is to win a cup. We won four cups. We were probably, we were a contender from 1993 legitimately to probably 08, 09, 010, 11. We were a cup contender from 1993 to 2011. Probably 18 years, you could say we were a legitimate yep. cup contender. We won four. We didn't win 12. We won four. They're hard to win. Everything has got to uh, fall right. And um, then he went on to say, uh, I'm doing what I believe is in the best interest of this franchise, of this fan base, of all those uh, players to try to build this team into a cup, cup contender. That's why I get up every day. That's my challenge. That's my goal because I love being a Red Wing. I love being a Red Wing. <laughs> I like this passion there, man. And I liked his knowledge. He knows how hard it is. And he talked about in this rebuild thing, is he says you have to be patient and, and, and I think he's learned, he learned that he took about two or three years to learn how hard it is, the, the rebuild thing. Yeah. What do you think of him? Well, I'd argue that Detroit was a Stanley Cup contender from 1991 to 2012, uh, which is the wow. precise length of Nicholas Lidstrom's astonishing NHL career. Like that guy really was a driver. The team got way better the year he arrived and it got way worse as soon as he left. Um, so, but uh, certainly they were like hard. Like, I can't think of a, a NHL hockey playoff draft that I didn't participate through the 90s and two, 2000s that didn't have like six Red Wings picked in the first round. They were always favored, whether they went all the way or they went part of the way. They, you know, they were right in the hunt for that very, very long time, as he suggests. And he was in the middle of that for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, 98. I mean, he, he was the head scout. Like he was, he was right there for all of it. And, and, and I, and I obviously talent and superstar talent is huge in the NHL, but so was good decision-making by the hockey boss, you know, hockey managers, top managers, Bruce, they set the tone for the entire organization, whatever they're in. And um, they make dozens of decisions, little decisions every day. And if their decisions are bad and driving everybody crazy, it all falls apart. If their decisions are consistently good, rational, and, and pick people up and motivate them, something special can happen. And I give Ken Hall and credit for making something special happen. And watching that interview, which I recommend any, everyone to watch, go on YouTube and watch it, you get a mm -hmm. sense of his abilities as a persuader, as an, as a, as an enthusiastic and, and um, persuader um, who also has lots of good ideas. And um, I, I came out of that watching that interview uh, I went in down on him because of his recent record, but just it, it made me think um, about what he's been doing recently and about his the skills that he does bring to the table. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm hopeful. I'm an Oiler fan, so of course I'm hopeful. Hopeful, but uh, I'm I, I'm not so convinced this is a terrible decision. Uh, put it that way. Here's, well, here's is one. he a good enough persuader to persuade the fan base that uh, this is a real change in direction and. Uh, 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 a new day looking forward or is the bitterness about the old boys club and the same old same old Nicholson hired one of his old buddies going to rule the day or is Ken Holland's force of personality enough to to uh, stir the drink Bruce how can this not be 
he's Mr. Red Wing. Like he he's the he is the Red Wings organization personified right now. And what whatever they were doing all those years, that's what he brings. And it wasn't what the Oilers were doing all those years. No. Sure wasn't that. So he's the boss. He's in charge of, of this whole thing. He, of, this is a major change in direction. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't see how you can see it as anything but that. And, and, and I, you know, I think we are going to see some changes, but just him being in charge, like I could see with, if Keith Gretzky had gotten the job, you might think it's more of the same or some younger guy um, who doesn't know, but come on, Ken Holland is going to be Ken Holland. He can't be anything but. So let's, here's one final quote. Uh, and this is from Jonathan Willis of the athletic who found this. Oh, yes. uh, so hat tip to Jonathan, but it's from uh, Jason Ferris from the book behind the moves. Yes. Ken, that's Holland nice. said, book. Ken Holland said, you're going to be tested at every turn as a manager. You're going to be tested by your patients. You're going to be tested by the owner's patients. You're going to be tested by the media, be tested by your coach, be tested by your players be tested by your peers. And, and of all the things actually that I've read, uh, that mm -hmm. one gave me the most encouragement. And it just, it's a, just a stark reminder of how much wisdom this man has accumulated and how many tests he's faced and passed. You don't face, you don't win four of these four Stanley Cups for and not face a thousand tests, big ones as a manager. Day after week, after week, after week, big tests, difficult players, difficult agents, difficult situations, a tough owner, this, that, and the other thing. And he, he passed them all well enough to win more Stanley cups than any other general hockey manager of his generation. Yeah. Well, he actually won three as GM. He assumed the role in 97 when they just won and they repeated a very, very difficult feat in 98. And, uh, did anyone else win three then? Maybe I was, did, uh, did Lamorella win three? Oh, Lamorella would have won three. Okay. Him and Lamorella. Two thousand. But it took him nine years to do it. And it took Holland basically, I guess, 11 years, 98, 02, and 08. Uh, you know, dynasties in the modern NHL look a lot different than the ones that won year after year. It's just the playoff grind it just makes it impossible. I guess Lombardi won two and Bowman, did Bowman win? No, uh, did they change GMs in Chicago? Stan Bowman won three. Did he win three? Stanley Glenn Bowman, yes, he did. Pretty impressive. Great, greatest name in hockey, Stanley Glenn Bowman, I think. He's, his first name, he's actually literally named after the cup, Stanley Cup. Glenn, he's named after Glenn Hall, uh, the great goaltender that sort of helped pave the way on Scotty Bowman's career. Uh, and Glenn was born the, the month that Scotty won his first cup. That's why he named him. Uh, Stanley uh, Bowman, named after Glenn Hall. And of course, his last name is named after the greatest coach of all time, who also happened to be the coach of Ken Holland when he took over the job in Detroit, one Scotty Bowman. So isn't that a great name? All three names are basically uh, Hall of Fame. Yeah, Hall good of one. <laughs> all right, uh, let's talk about the next coach. So there was a rumor, uh, the, the same guy who broke the story, the guy of Regina, is it Rod, Rob, Rod Peterson? Yeah. Um, he broke the Holland thing last uh, week. Mm -hmm. He's saying, like, there, there was a rumor, excuse me, talk that Dave Tippett might get the job. But um, uh, Peterson was saying, no, he doesn't think that's that's in the cards. And uh, it's, it seems like it might still be pretty wide open about who the, the uh, you know, Mike Babcock's name has come up. Oh yeah. Um, so we'll find out. We'll find out soon. I don't. Uh, I, I. I really. Todd Nelson was the coach in Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. I really like Todd Nelson as a coach. I think he's one of these uh, offensive. He's one of these player whisperers. Mm -hmm. uh, a real players coach who gets the most out of his talent. Who's in it, um, and I think he's really underrated because he's. I don't know. He's not. Uh, there's something about him. He's kind of. Um, not not super duper well spoken maybe i don't know if that's the right not the way you know he's not a not the sharpest dresser maybe like he's he doesn't have the nice hair like dallas akins uh but man the guy uh he's had some success at the hl he, level he's meat and potatoes yeah that's what he is and and he's very much a player's coach uh he's very much a, a 
a media's coach, I think, a fan's coach, like he talks the common man's language. And uh, he pays attention to detail. Uh, I had some dealings with him when he was coaching in Oklahoma City. I, I had a couple times uh, went down to Calgary to watch the Barons play, and then I got to interview uh, Nelson and also after uh, some of the rookie games where he would be the coach. And, of course, he was Oilers interim head coach for a uh, half season there uh, before the uh, McDavid lottery changed everything. Uh, and who knows how he would have done had he been given that opportunity. But uh, uh, he's he's certainly a candidate. And I think his familiarity with um, uh, with the GM is probably more than his, of more value than his familiarity with the city, but he's actually got both. He's now the assistant coach, associate coach in Dallas. So um, mm-hmm. he is in the NHL again. And mm-hmm. anyway, I think he should be, I, I, I think he should be in the running, if not, if not the mm-hmm. favorite. That's my that's my thought. Although there might be, a, I, I'm not an expert on all the candidates. So I another don't another interesting name in the running. The landscape has changed just this morning with some big news out of Philadelphia, where Elaine Vigneault has hired two high-powered assistant coaches in uh, Michelle Terry and, and Mike Yo, both you know multiple-time NHL coaches with some record of success. So those guys are off the market, but in so doing, they fired. Chris Knobloch to make room for these guys. And Chris Knobloch is a guy who checks a few boxes. Coach McDavid in, uh, uh, in junior hockey, of course, very and had great success there. And I'm not sure that he's, you know, I mean, I think he's, let's put it this way, he's in the mix of people that they should consider when looking for their next head coach. Okay, Bruce, let's quickly go over the one or two moves or the like the general trend that uh, – challenge Holland has to face and maybe how you think he can solve it. I, I can start out. I just think personally, I think what I was worried about more than anything was a GM that was going to come in and, and do what Aikens did essentially. And he was the coach, but just bring in like discount everyone in the Oilers system, discount everything about the Oilers and just rip it up and try to bring in his own guys. And uh, I, I just think that's a terrible approach. The Oilers have a great farm system right now or at least a good one in bakersfield lots of good players and mm-hmm. i just think and i'm really encouraged actually by holland's patience his approach i think he's the right guy i think he's going to come in and really thoroughly assess and properly assess what's going on in bakersfield he, he knows jay woodcroft um and um he i i just would advise him to do i i think there's very little you can do with the owners because of the cap situation i don't think you can buy out lucic i think it's a bad idea to buy out Sekera given the need for a top four demon, and he can be that. Russell's a possibility for a trade. If you can make that happen, maybe even a buyout. But um, I'm not convinced about that because you also need NHL to D-men, and, and Russell mm-hmm. certainly is that. Um, so I, I I would like, I think there's a possibility they can bring in a, one player. Uh, like they can bring in a low-cost goalie, top priority, and then they can bring in a, one forward, either a, another center a really good center to play the third line or a a good winger top at first or second line as probably more like a second line winger. And in terms of acquisitions, I think that's about it. One winger and a goalie. Um, And if they can, if he can do well on that, that would be fantastic because I, I think the defense court, all the players are there that they need. They just need to let them develop. And I think he's going to let that happen. So what's your take? Well, he, Comes in, takes over a roster that's uh, kind of lopsided. I've just been working on this this morning. And for 2019-20, they have 17 players under contract. And by the time you, you calculate in a couple of buyouts, which aren't going anywhere, the cap hit is already $72.2 million for next year for 17 players. Now, the rumor... Uh, cap increased to 83 million. Recent rumors say scale that back, so it might be closer to I don't know, maybe 81 million. Whatever that gives them, like probably less than 10 million uh, to add six players plus a little bit of um, uh, leave a little room for injury call-ups and stuff. And it's not a lot. So either some of these, one or more of these bodies have to get moved out or dealt with in some way or other. Or he really does have limited options. Yeah. Who would you move? 
Now the imbalance part is uh, I and mean, that's the question. So who burst? Like I mean, well, you mentioned. I mean, Russell is one such example. Uh, uh, Andrew Sekera, I think, is an example. Uh, Brandon Manning. I mean, how do you even move that? Like that's just a poison pill left at the bottom of the death chart by Chirelli. Um, they've got under contract of the 17 8 or defensemen. So if you're going to make room for one or two of these young defensemen, you've already got eight guys under contract uh, for next year on one-way contracts, then something's got to give. So that's the real challenge. And then, then up front, under contract for next year, and I'm listing by na natural position, to, and uh, they have one, uh, one left winger, one right winger, six centers. And now, of course, some of those centers, Dreisaitl, Gagne in particular, probably will play on the wing. But when it comes to actual natural wingers, uh, they're they're going to have to flesh that out. And they have they do have a couple of in-house options in Pulvarvi and Kara, both of whom I think they will sign. Uh, but that's going to inflate that 72 million figure by some amount because they have you know they obviously have to pay them. I don't think over much. But uh, after that, they're going to have to find. Uh, good depth players and without a lot of money to do it. It's a huge challenge. Well, I think the depth players are on in Bakersfield right now. And mm -hmm. um, I just think they need to find one top guy, figure out a way to get one top guy to play with McDavid or Dreisaitl uh, on the wing. And um, a first or second line winger would be fantastic. Um, they might be able to move out Lucic uh, in a trade. I'm going to examine that a little further. They're going to have to get at least, they'd have to take the full 50% cap hit, but there's a possibility that that can happen. Um, or they'd have to trade him for another bad contract in Louis Erickson. Louis Erickson. Yeah, which does rich. nothing to solve the cap issue. Which doesn't solve the cap. It, it shortens the, the duration of it. Though, so. Anyway, Holland is very much in some ways, like I guess he's in, he's in a situation in terms of his Detroit years it's not like the detroit in 2017 where there's no superstars he's got his superstars um he, he you know there was no situation like this in detroit exactly like this in detroit because the cap wasn't in place when he needed to add to the team in other years so he could just go out and sign players he can't do that in edmonton but i think he's learned about building a team under the cap in the last few years and i think he's been doing a good job for the last two years in detroit building a team in the cap system. I like what I see. So I'm hopeful that he's going to apply the lessons that he, some hard lessons that I, I think he learned in Detroit and um, come up with some, some decent answers in Edmonton. And I don't think we're going to see some of the bad moves that Shirelli made in terms of focusing on heavy hockey, because that's not his inclination. So. No, no. Well, he's starting. I mean, he has to clear a low bar to be better than Shirelli. Pains me to say it, but it's, <laughs> You know, I mean, his he started at least with a vision that proved to be not the correct vision. And then by the end, he was just trying to piecemeal these uh, Band-Aid solutions that just piled on to the existing problems without solving any of them. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. I mean, what a mess. He did. Uh, he did create. He did leave the cupboard stocked with some good prospects, Bruce. Yes. Peter Shelley, give him yeah. credit. And yeah. to give him more credit, signed uh, Dave McDavid and Dry Saddle eight years apiece. Yeah, and, and he, he did. They did win one playoff series. Uh, yeah, Peter Shrelly, which is more than you know the people in, with. The, I know they have a Hall of Fame management in Toronto right now, but it's yet to happen there. All right, Bruce, let's <laughs> let's leave it there, man. Okay, I'm sure we'll have a, probably yeah. official announcement tomorrow on the on yeah. Holland. Probably we'll have more to say then. But uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for being here. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.